Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Marta Iljadica from the CREATE Center. Um, and welcome to the third CREATE public lecture this term. Um, we're very happy to have Dr. Emily Hudson with us, who is a reader in law at King's College London. And can I just say that it's wonderful to just see uh, so many people um, participating as well um, in the audience. Um, so, as many of you will know, um, CREATE is the UK Copyright and Creative Economy Centre, and we are part of the Horizon 2020 funded consortium Recreating Europe, and this is a co-organised um, public lecture. And I wanted to just say a little bit about uh, Recreating Europe. Um, so, in this consortium, we've been working for just over a year to map, to measure, um, and to assess the development and the future of digital copyright um, culture and creativity in the EU. Um, and most recently, for example, our colleagues have produced a report on the existing legal frameworks for libraries and archives in the EU. And there is another report on mapping copyright exceptions in the EU. So as you can imagine, we are absolutely delighted to have um, Dr. Hudson give this lecture. And um, Emily's new book, Drafting Copyright Exceptions from the Law in Books to the Law in Action, is really an exceptional account of copyright management practices in cultural institutions that span Australia, Canada, um, the US and the UK, and is based on really quite phenomenal and extensive research. Um, so I will shortly give the floor, as it were, to Emily. Um, and then after Emily's lecture, my colleague Bartolomeo Meletti will offer a short response and ask um, the opening questions. Um, if you would like to submit a question of your own, um, please do so using the Q&A function because the chat is disabled. And then um, I will select a question um, and then uh, read out your name and your question for Emily to respond. Um, I would like to ask you please just to make it a little bit easier to um, make your questions perhaps no longer than uh, one or two sentences. Um, and just a final point to note uh, that this webinar is being recorded. Okay, but for now, um, it's over to you, Emily, to talk to us all about an empirical perspective on drafting copyright exceptions. Thank you, Marta. So I'm just going to do the setup now. Um, we share screen, so you should be able to see the PowerPoints now. Um, and I'm just also setting myself up. So Marta, can you see the slides? Yes, Bart, Bart said yes. Okay, so you guys can now mute and I shall take over for, for the next little bit. Um, and I wanted to start by thanking Marta um, and everyone else at CREATE for the invitation. Also, I was just having a look at the participants list and there are a number of participants who are interviewees in this project. And I am not allowed to thank you by name, I'm not allowed to mention you by name, but I do want to take this opportunity to thank all the interviewees and institutions that participated in the research um, because it, it is very um, generous to have given up your time to assist with, with this work. So with that said, um, in my prepared remarks, I'd like to do two things. The first is to provide an overview of the goals of the monograph and the empirical research it describes, and that will be relatively brief. And the second thing, which will be the bulk of the presentation, is to draw from the analysis in the monograph to present some thoughts about the drafting of copyright exceptions in the UK in a post-Brexit world. I hope that in doing this, I'll illustrate some of the central ideas in the monograph, including the need for us to remember that there can be a vast gap between the law and books, so statutes, cases, commentary, and so forth, written by um, legal experts, um, and the law in action. That is the law as understood and practiced by everyday users. And the problem is that much legal analysis, including on questions like the adequacy of copyright exceptions, is focused heavily on the law in books. 
But whilst that sort of doctrinal um, analysis might be an important and indeed indispensable part of any evaluation of the law, if we proceed without any consideration of user behaviours, we risk misdiagnosing problems, uh, we risk misdiagnosing problems and recommending ineffective solutions. And so hence the title of this talk, An Empirical Perspective on Drafting Copyright Exceptions. So let's start with this overview. And the um, book is centered on a case study on the copyright management practices of cultural institutions in Australia, Canada, the United States and the United Kingdom. This case study draws not only from publicly available sources, but also from interviews conducted with hundreds of staff from cultural institutions and peak bodies um, this field work having taken place over some 14 years. Now, the research was not originally intended as a project about copyright exceptions. And indeed, interviewees were asked questions about all manner of aspects of, of copyright management um, in their institutions. But I found the data on copyright exceptions um, to be particularly interesting. Um, and so just to give you a brief snapshot of that. In the first couple of phases of research, in phases one and two, there was considerable divergence in the reported experiences of those in the US, where interviewees seem to be very comfortable in relying on fair use, including for on-site and online activities and those in Australia and Canada where interviewees described a far less prominent role for fair dealing and tended to rely on sector specific exceptions for more sort of internal activities like administration and preservation. And in thinking about why this was the case, a key conclusion at that point was that it's not just about the law. So for instance, if one was to compare US and Canadian law um, at the time, there were numerous similarities between the law on exceptions in those two countries. Um, so fair use and fair dealing both involve fairness infrastructure. The Canadian fieldwork field work took place some five years after the Supreme Court of Canada handed down its um, judgment in CCH and Law Society of Upper Canada a case which urged a large and liberal interpretation of fair dealing purposes um, and which described exceptions as users' rights. So given this backdrop, why was it that there was a meaningful role for fair use in the United States, but only limited recourse to fair dealing in Canada, just despite everything that was said by the Supreme Court? And I explore this in detail in the book, but some of the reasons related to copyright management techniques. So things like the greater expertise amongst um, staff in US institutions in relation to copyright, a more commercial um, attitude to risk, but also the historical and philosophical context that CCH was perceived as a significant step away from prevailing understandings of exceptions, workflows had developed in institutions in an environment in which fair dealing played a, a marginal um, role. And changing these workflows required a major shift in thinking that institutions at that stage had not countenanced. In phase three, I undertook new field work. So um, this was doctorate awarded CUP publishing contract in hand, and I promised them more field work. And over the years, I've thought that, that was rash and possibly a mistake, but I've actually come to realize that a long gestation on an empirical project is sometimes no bad thing. Because I think the phase three work really added a lot to the understanding developed in that, that the, uh, the first two phases, in particular, in relation to the dynamism of um, practices and norms that, um, that I saw by returning to Australia, by continuing to follow developments, particularly in Canada in the university sector, and by adding the UK, could see this, this 
um, these changes to practices and norms taking place in the sector. And this relates to a very important point about what I'm gonna say. The book is not a comprehensive survey of practices. It is not quantitative. It is not about what institutions do as though that's some sort of immutable thing that can be measured. Rather, it's intended to capture how people think about copyright. What sort of act factors influence when and how norms change. So then returning um, to the book, um, what I then sought to do in the book was to draw from this research to address in particular the question about what does this mean for the drafting of copyright exceptions? So drawing from the interpretive practices of, of, of users, how should we draft exceptions? And also to think more broadly about this idea of the law in books versus the law in action. So that's a snapshot. Um, and um, what I want to do in the prepared remarks now is focus on copyright in the UK in a post-Brexit world. But as indicated on the slide, I am more than happy in the question time to talk about anything that could, could conceivably be in or related to the book. So please ask away. Um, but I want for, for now to, to think about what might the UK do in relation to copyright exceptions now that it's no longer in the EU, no longer bound by EU copyright directives, no longer bound by new decisions of the Court of Justice. So what should happen? Now, um, the question that I think is going to come up is whether the UK should implement fair use. Because anyone who has worked in any detail or in, for any time on exceptions will often get asked this question about whether countries like the UK with what is fundamentally a closed list of ex exceptions should move to an open-ended fair use model. Um, and indeed fair use is, um, and the fair use panacea is a core organizing theme in the book. Um, the book discusses reasons in favor of fair use and I'm on the record um, as supporting the implementation of fair use in Australia. Despite that, despite that, I think this is the wrong question, at least for now and at least in isolation. And there's a number of reasons for this. One is, the lack of legislative bandwidth. So leaving aside all the policy and empirical questions about whether we should introduce fair use, which is itself a big project, there's also a question of how to do it. This is not just a matter of writing a new section 28AA into the CDPA, right? We need to think about various questions. What form would UK fair use take? Would it follow the US provision in section 107? Would it take an extended fair dealing approach where you make the fair dealing purposes illustrative through adding the words such as, or would we take an autochthonous approach and come up with something entirely different? Furthermore, it's not just what you write in, it's what you cross out. So would fair dealing be repealed? What other sector specific exceptions might also um, um, be um, removed? in this environment. So this is actually quite a big project. The UK government is not at the moment projecting that this would be a, a, an immediate priority. Um, so at this stage, I think there's just not the legislative bandwidth. But let's say there was the legislative bandwidth. I think the next thing one needs to think about in any project in favor of uh, uh, fair use is this will be potentially quite politically unattractive for government. So um, if other countries are anything to go by, there will likely be a polarized review process in which certain respondents argue emphatically against fair use. And in the face of this disagreement, the government may be very reluctant to adopt fair use if other intermediate positions are available. This is what's happened in Australia where there have been a number of, of really significant law reform reports in the recent years that have recommended in favour of fair use. Um, and the latest news from, from the Australian government 
a bit old now, old news, but is that their proposed reform is a quotation exception and um, some other specific exceptions. So despite everything that's happened in Australia, no fair use. And so we, we, we need to face that reality of the politics of fair use. Finally, and I'm actually going to pause on this point for the next few minutes. There's a question about whether we need it. So we need to be very clear about the problems that we think exist in relation to exceptions and how fair use would address those concerns. So for instance, if our concern is that cultural and educational institutions are not making enough use of exceptions, would fair use change that state of affairs? And I think one thing we really have to be careful of is conceding too much in relation to the capacity for expanded fair dealing. So that is more fair dealing purposes alongside well-drafted specific exceptions to do very similar work to fair use. So exploring some of these points in a bit more detail. I start from the proposition that fair use is attractive as a reform option. I've argued in favor of it. The book argues in favor of it. It would be surprising that I sort of backpedal now out of that position. Um, and there are a number of reasons it's attractive. I've already mentioned one, it works, right? The empirical evidence is that it works in cultural institutions in the United States. There's other research as well, both empirical and doctrinal to put the case in favor of, of fair use. Um, also, if we look at this through the lens of standards and rules, fair use may be particularly attractive in terms of legislative efficiency. Um, so what I mean there is that um, copyright cases often involve very divergent fact patterns. Um, um, we will I, and I think we, they require and they demand a quite fact intensive inquiry. And it's simply not realistic to expect the legislature to have the time and the foresight to articulate in advance a series of rules that cover every possible situation and contingency. So in the face of highly variable fact patterns, the most efficient form of legal drafting is to enact a standard under which the judge decides not just findings of fact, but how the law then applies to those facts. Um, and it might be so it said that fair use is particularly well adapted to that because of its fairness factors and open-ended list of purposes. Um, fair use can therefore be said to be self-updating in terms of judges and users being able to update interpretations in response to technological change and so forth without having to go back to the legislature all the time to ask for more reforms. Finally, fair use could have a strong signaling effect. We might say well, the problem with tinkering with exceptions is it doesn't really send the message that things need to change in the way that fair use might send that message in terms of we need to reboot the system, you need to revise your workflows. Um, bearing in mind too that depending on what is drafted and that's very very important, depending on, on what form of fair use the UK went with, it's not an unknown quantity. In fact, I think from talking with regular folk, sometimes you actually have to explain why the UK does not have fair use, because they've been consuming so much US media and media products that they think fair use is a thing that exists here. Um, so we're familiar with it. Now, the next point though, to come from the fieldwork is legislative reforms and landmark cases do not necessarily lead to a change in practices. And I've already given the example of what happened in Canada in the five years after CCH and Law Society. So there were um, plenty of interviewees who basically had, hadn't heard of the case. Um, there was in a number of public libraries and some archives, um, um, some reports that existing researcher request services, the fit that a fair dealing approach was sort of fortified by CCH. Um, the main actual change was in academic libraries where a few wild and crazy types, that was the exact language used by the interviewee, um, um, decided to move to digital delivery for some um, researcher requests. So that was that really at that at the time five years after CCH was was what had happened, um, despite 
everything that was said in the Supreme Court in the strongest possible terms that fair dealing should have a meaningful operation, exceptions are users' rights. But let's also talk about Australia and the flirtation, actually it's still ongoing, it's quite a long and sad flirtation, with um, what I think was originally termed flexible dealing. Um, I think that language may have sort of disappeared after a while, but fair use for cultural and educational institutions. So this came after a review of copyright exceptions in 2005, um, where there was some interest in reform to exceptions due to the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement. Um, and the upshot of that process was that um, uh, this new exception with the stated aim of capturing some of the benefits of fair use, but for only for certain users. So educational and cultural institutions being um, the, the two key users over time who enjoy this exception. Um, and what the legislative drafters came up with was this autochthonous drafting in which the three-step test from TRIPS is operative in terms of the um, application of this exception. Um, so in the phase three fieldwork in Australia in 2012 and 2016, again, so sort of six and then 10 years after this provision was introduced, it was said that section 200 AB had a marginal relevance to practices and a number of reasons were given, but one was the words of the provision which institutions and their legal advisors struggled to interpret. So section 200 AB was seen as being convoluted, technical, full of legalese, and yet also lacking in meaning and authoritative guidance. Um, and even where there were interviewees who themselves felt comfortable with what section 200 AB might mean, they would say that they found it very hard to make a clear and compelling case to those higher up in their institutions about why it should be relied upon. Um, and remember, this relates to three-step test language. It's not, not that the Australian drafters were completely crazy in what they came up with for their exception. This is, this is the user response to the three-step test. Um, and also though, the fieldwork showed something else which is that norms and practices can change because of other in events and imperatives. So one is legislative inertia. Let's go back to Australia for this one. So as I've just said, we've had loads and that we had section 200 AB in 2006, and this is, this is not had traction. There's been lots of discussions about whether or not Australia should adopt fair use reports, law reform reports, concluding that it should, bits and bobs of legislative reform, but nothing's really happening in terms of comprehensive reform, nothing's really happening in relation to orphaned works. And so at the same, very same interviews in 2012 and 2016, when interviews were saying, we don't rely on section 200 AB, they would refer regularly to risk managing stuff. So the solution uploaded in Australia for the fact that the legislature had not intervened was to actually think much more about risk management as a way forward to deal with some of their copyright issues. So risk management for orphaned works, risk management for unpublished collections. Now there'll be limits to how far that goes, but it's just to bear in mind that in, that's an instance where there was a major shift in attitudes over from the initial field work to the later field work in Australia in relation to comfort with risk. And they would still say they're conservative um, or somewhat conservative, but there was really quite a significant increase in knowledge, increase in um, sort of the risk appetite and so forth. Another event that might lead to change is overreaching by a copyright collective. And I'm thinking here in particular of the experiences in Canada where after the field work, the main Canadian field work, there was a very dramatic shift in practices in Canadian universities, um, which was from 2010 onwards and involved a huge departure from the access copyright reprographic license for educational copying. And 
by that stage, we'd had CCH, the pentalogy, which is, was five cases handed down by the Supreme Court in relation to copyright, including another forward-leaning fair dealing case, was to come down in July 2012. There's also been legislative reform in Canada um, under the Copyright Modernization Act to expand fair dealing to include education, parody and satire. But the other thing that occurred at that time was access copyright heading off to the um, Copyright Board and seeking a copyright tariff where the headline figure of how much universities would pay per student for the license was so alarming that the bean counters got involved at the universities and upper level management to say, we are going to change the way we do copyright. Now, to be clear, they have not just gone off into exceptions land. They are mostly using licensing, but it's licensing done with database providers and transactionally and so forth, and then fair dealing operating to kind of for that for a little bit of leftover stuff as well. So it, it's mostly a licensing approach, but they're doing it all in house. Um, and there is ongoing debates about this, including um, litigation that is about to be before the Supreme Court. It's going to be heard in May in relation to um, access copyright and York University. Um, but the key thing is, is that there can be, there was in, in Canada, there were already people saying we can make greater use of fair dealing. But at the time, rolling over the access licenses had a cost benefit analysis that worked out in favor of just rolling them over until things change and the universities properly change their workflows. And this it required a huge amount of investment to change the way copyright was managed within, within the university sector. Finally, we might also have a change due to a global pandemic. Um, and I think this has been particularly significant for education. I'm gonna to return to this because I think that we are going to see some changes made during the pandemic surviving the hopefully soon emergence um, from, um, from COVID-19. So in sum, change the law in books does not necessarily require, sorry, change the law in action does not necessarily require change the law in books. We need to ask ourselves, what is legislative reform intended to achieve? We wanting to broaden exceptions, clarify their scope, encourage use, some combination, and then ask, is legislative reform necessary to achieve those goals or could they, they be achieved through other mechanisms? So I'm now going to um, talk about some lessons and I apologize. The best way forward is for me to just brain dump a series of ideas onto the slides without pausing too much. So but I'm happy to take, take questions on this in, in the question time. So, um, First of all, what I think we need to ask ourselves is, does the UK already have almost everything it needs? I think this is really taking seriously the idea that the 2014 reforms have introduced some very important fair dealing purposes, which have the ability to do quite a lot of work. So starting with the academic interpretation, so somewhat ironically starting with the law and books as written by the particularly bookish individuals, um, we have, for instance, with quotation, a lot of work done on quotation by um, uh, professors Applin and Bentley, um, arguing that quotation is far broader than previously appreciated. Um, and in fact, one of the provocations in their book is whether or not quotation can sort of be seen um, as having these fair use like qualities. So we have quotation as a potentially quite broad um, exception. Um, I've also done work on pastiche and I love pastiche because nobody knows what it means, but when you find out what it means, it's not just parody by another name, in my opinion, at least the IPO guidance on this provision was pastiche is musical or other composition made up of selections from various sources or one that imitates the style of another artist or period. That is, I think, an accurate, accurate reflection of what the OED and other standard English dictionaries and specialist texts um, say about pastiche. It has two limbs. One is the assembly of existing sources. The other is imitation in the style of. Um, and in the article on the slide, I argue that um, 
pastiche could apply to mashups, fan fiction, music sampling, collage, appropriation art, medleys, and many other forms of homage and compilation. Um, and indeed, when the German court heard Pelham and Hutter, one of the quotation cases on return, that was the music sampling case, it said it didn't think that the music sampling could be quotation or parody, but did think it could be pastiche, which I think is, is correct. And to the extent I do know there's been some pushback against this legal analysis based on um, a perception that's not correct um, given the sort of EU system, well, the UK is not in it anymore. So this is now a chance to detach from narrower understandings of quotation or views on what pastiche might mean. And then finally, we've got illustration for instruction, which as I said, I think has had quite a lot of post book movement given the pandemic. So let's um, then talk a bit about the empirical work given that I said that it was um, important. Um, in relation to quotation, um, bear in mind that I, I did some work sort of, uh, with UK interviewees at around the time the 2014 re reforms came into force and then again a number of years later. So things are still relatively early, but the way in which UK interviewees discussed quotation, I thought reminded me of how US interviewees discussed fair use. Um, quotation was described as nicely nondescript it was being used in public facing activities. Um, and there was evidence of incremental expansion in the circumstance of the circumstances in which um, cultural institutions would rely on quotation um, rather than getting a license. Now in saying this, one thing that's important to note is that the sort of uses described by interviewees typically involved literal copying of discrete parts of works so reproducing a block of text or playing an extract of a sound recording in, in an exhibition. So they weren't sort of engaged in some of the acts that Applin and Bentley would say fall within the quotation exception, which um, Applin and Bentley uh, suggest can be quite transformative. Um, um, but um, I, think it, I think it goes to show though that, that in the absence of any case law, um, institutions were very comfortable with quotation and I, and I think that could continue over time. Um, in relation to illustration for instruction, um, it was clear that amongst non-university institutions that interviewees saw illustration for instruction as applying to them, even though they're not traditional educational institutions, section 32 is not um, limited in that way. Um, and they didn't, they also didn't limit their reliance on section 32 to instances which might involve a sort of more traditional classroom setup. That said, they did seem to accept that some um, instruction was necessary. Amongst university participants, there were more questions about exactly how section 32 operates. So for instance, does it apply where you make content available on a virtual um, learning environment or is it really only limited to things in the classroom? And I think the observation I'd make is that I really feel like during the pandemic, there's been a lot of focus on teaching online. And I think that my sense is that universities have adopted a, a much broader interpretation of section 32. So I wonder whether the pandemic has just sped up that process of kind of incrementally flowing into section 32 and, and, and reaching for broader interpretations. And I suspect that this will continue, um, as I said, post pandemic. Um, I'm looking at the clock, but do not worry because the next few slides, this is where I'm really gonna go through the brain dump of ideas, right? So do not worry, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to go on forever. It's gonna come to an end soon. So, um, expanded fair dealing is not an undesirable, merely second best option. It's something which is worthy of consideration in its own right. But that doesn't mean the UK should do nothing. If we are interested in getting the pen out and um, reforming the statute, here's a few things we could do. So 
I think removing unnecessary limiting language from fair dealing could be something that would be attractive. And just a few ideas, this is not intended to be comprehensive, but it's taking out things that don't need to be there. We don't need to limit research and study to, to non-commercial research and study. We're out of the EU, we can get rid of that. Requirements for sufficient acknowledgements, uh, unless required specifically by a, a, a particular um, international instrument or, or what have you, can, can go. Um, criticism and review, um, you can get rid of the requirement that the that the criticism or review relate to that or another work can get rid of the public availability um, requirement. Can also think about making sure that the purposes are not described in an unduly limited fashion. So I think reporting current events will be better described as reporting news. Change illustration for instruction, which sounds kind of limited and and narrow just with education. The Canadians have, Canadians have done it, so it's, it's not like there's no precedent for that. I would also suggest um, revising section 171.3 to reaffirm the existence and operation of the public interest defense to copyright infringement. This being a very important um, defense, particularly in whistleblower contexts. Um, you could make reforms to various other, other exceptions. We don't, for instance, have an exception covering administrative uses by cultural institutions. That's actually not a problem in practice, but if you want to revise the act, um, may as well do this on the way through. Dedicated terminals could also be revised to make it clear that it extends to secure networks accessible off-site. Um, for orphaned works, and I'm very happy to explain my reasoning, um, because I do not share the concerns about uh, that others have, have mentioned about losing the EU um, orphaned works exception. I'm actually quite happy with that and more than, more than happy to explain why and, have, and, be, and be told why I'm wrong, um, but I would go with the remedies exception instead. And finally, and I do wonder whether this is actually one of the most important things and it's last on my list, but whether it should be first on the agenda is to fix up technological measures. The section 296ZE scheme is not fit for purpose. It needs to be changed. Now, um, in thinking about these possible law reforms, um, we need to think about what are our new and future trade agreement, um, trade, agree trade agreements going to look like. The UK has um, announced its intent to join the huge trading partnership under the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, so you might say UK is not in the Pacific. Well, Australia gets in Eurovision, right? So let's not, let's not be too, too thingy about what Pacific means. The UK can be a Pacific nation if it wants. But what's interesting about the CPTPP is this emphasis on balance that appears in a number of the provisions and the public policy objectives of IP systems. So in actual fact, this is not only the suggestions I've made would not only not be inconsistent with this trade deal, but actually I think are reflecting a move perhaps towards balance and more respect for exceptions as needing to do meaningful work. So second last slide, the last one just says thank you. So this is really the last main slide. What can institutions do to increase the use of exceptions? Because it's not all about the law. Um, um, what can we do? Well, lots of things. And in fact, when I look at this list, I feel quite positive about the position the UK is in because I think, think these things are already happening um, to quite some degree, at least in larger institutions, right? The appropriate resourcing of copyright you need copyright experts on staff. They need time to think about and draft policies. You might need a centralized team, depending on the institution, to handle licensing and clearance and advice on, on exceptions and so forth. This needs to go all the way to the top. So I think one of the problems people experience is the librarian who's like really into copyright and has great ideas and no manager higher up says yes. So in actual fact, the education needs to go up um, and, and some of the institutions I dealt with with the most forward-leaning copyright policies were those when actually the interview was with the director of the library. Um, you do get some people who are higher up in institution management who really are thinking a lot about copyright and they get, they, 
those institutions often have a really forward leaning approach for risk management exceptions and so forth. Upgrade risk appetite, reframe how corporate problems are viewed. So sometimes I think we language um, copyright problems um, in terms of things like, if I do X, will there be a, an issue with copyright? And then somebody says, yes, there will be an issue. Um, and that can really like push people towards saying no. Whereas if you say, um, for instance, to go back to the debate about using films in teaching, which has been going on the last year or so, if you say showing entire films in a film studies module is a mission critical activity that has to take place, how do we do it in a way that minimizes risk? That's a very different way of, of viewing copyright. And I think really helps reframe how we approach issues. I think the other things on the slide are self-explanatory, having cross-sector discussions, supporting colleagues in institutions that may not have the ability to resource copyright as much. And finally, encouragement of the use of exceptions by others. So does your website say, please use exceptions, here's what they mean, um, and so forth. So um, landed the plane a little bit late, but hopefully that's okay. Um, so thank you very much again for listening. And I think Bart's now going to step in with, with his thoughts and a few questions. So thank you very much to everyone for listening. Um, if, if Bart doesn't mind, I'm going to just jump in very quickly just to say thank you. That's fascinating. And I think there's so much to think about there. Um, and I think many people who are listening will sort of recognize things there that are relevant and important. Um, and for some, including absolutely Bartolomeo now, which speak, I think, directly to the research that's being done in CREATE. So I'm just going to stop and let Bart, um, I think, respond and ask the first questions. Yeah, thanks, Marta. And yeah, thanks very much, Emily, for your excellent and fascinating uh, public lecture. I really enjoyed it. So yeah, your research, you know, provides uh, really interesting insights about how the law in books translates to law in action and how empirical work into the letter can inform good legislative drafting. As, uh, as Marta mentioned, you know, this is very relevant for research that we're currently conducting at CREATE in collaboration with the EFIL Center at the University of Amsterdam for the Horizon 2020 Consortium Recreating Europe. Uh, in fact, you know, taking, taking inspiration from uh, you know, the project Reclaiming Fair Use uh, by Patricia Havderhide and Peter Zavvi, uh, one of our goals is basically to develop codes of best practices in reusing audiovisual materials for documentary filmmakers in the UK and the Netherlands. So basically starting from a, an analysis of the issues faced by the sector, you know, the project aims to identify and codify uh, shared principles and best practices that filmmakers can rely on to make informed decisions uh, on the reuse of protected materials. Also, as you know, uh, together with Chris Morrison and Jane Secker, we are also conducting a similar project for the education sector and in particular for film studies educators. So I have uh, two questions you know, for you uh, related to these projects. Uh, one is a theoretical question and the other one is a slightly more practical one. So my first question is, so in addition to informing legal drafting, uh, can the law in action also help courts interpret the existing law in books? And more specifically to the UK context, you know, can creative and cultural practice play a role in defining sector specific notions of fairness? So that's my first one. Uh, the second one is a bit more practical and came up just two days ago at the first workshop with documentary filmmakers that uh, Stefan Gompel from EFIR and I conducted for Recreating Europe. So what documentary filmmakers wanted to ask you is, what is the difference between commercial and non-commercial use and how does that affect you know, relying on exceptions? And interestingly, you know, the same question also came up at the online workshops that we conducted last summer with film studies teachers, but with an important difference. So, you know, while teachers were kind of keen for their activities to be considered non-commercial and so hopefully allowed, documentary filmmakers don't, don't want, you know, that distinction between commercial and non-commercial purposes to act as a constraint. Because, you know, even when they uh, produce like publicly funded films that may not have an immediate commercial purpose, you know, they don't want to lose commercial viability either. So, you know, they want their films to do well and eventually become commercial. Uh, 
So, so these are my uh, points and uh, uh, questions. So it would be great uh, to hear your thoughts on those. And once again, uh, thanks very much for your excellent lecture. Thank you. Okay, so I'll start with the question about codes of practice. Um, I think actually you've asked about it in the context of what judges might do and how they might use codes of practice. But I, I actually think what we could do is, is, is in thinking about the use of a code of codes of practice, actually step back even before we're in court. Because the reality is that most disputes will not get into court, right? So in actual fact, you've got this big period before a trial for the parties to negotiate and settle the dispute. Or indeed, just for somebody to push back and say, well, this is my position, and if you don't like it, sue me. And I think that one of the benefits of the codes of practice, well, there's a number actually, but what I can see is, first of all, it indicates that there's been some cross or, or in, intra, intra-sector dialogue. So you're saying this isn't just the crazy position that we adopt, in actual fact, it is a sector-wide approach. That indicates there's been thinking, hopefully expert advice. There's been a degree of, of, of then collaboration and dialogue. So that itself is important in terms of generating practices. Then I can imagine that that could actually be something that if you're then faced a dispute and you're, dis you're negotiating with somebody, that could be used. Firstly, in a soft way, in terms of saying, well, actually, this is something lots of people in the sector do and have thought about and agree with. But then in a more potentially, depending on how much of a junkyard litigator you want to be, in a more forceful position, which has said, we've thought about it, this is what we do. Right. So I can imagine, I think that's just one thing to bear in mind, particularly in talking to documentary filmmakers and other users. I think people imagine complaint comes in and next moment I'm in front of, 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 of justice insert your name here presenting my cogent legal arguments and so in actual fact their use at other stages i think the one risk with codes but this is more cross sector negotiated codes is if they inadvertently or if they are tempted to be used as a maximum or ceiling so you may have heard in the US context with some, for instance, the classroom copying guidelines, which were negotiated between publishers and, and educators being attempted to be used in the Georgia state litigation as some sort of cap on what reasonable copying looks like. But I don't think that's what you're talking about. And I think that if it's, if it's people within the sector coming together, then I think I can, I can imagine that when you're then presenting your arguments in court, it may not necessarily be that there is or should be something called what does the sector think, right? Because I think we've pushed back on market harm analysis for the same reason, right? It's just going to be claimants with self-fulfilling arguments as to why it is that, um, that, that their market's been harmed. But I can imagine taking some of the arguments from those guides because they will go to all the specific fairness factors and being able to present, to present that. And I think also just... Um, in terms of sort of, I think that being a likable defendant always helps. And if you can point to a, a, a guide that has been, or protocols or guidelines that you are, are fulfilling, I think that that's, that's no bad thing. So um, that, that's what I'd have to say in relation to your first question. Your second question sounds like they're kind of wanting a little bit of legal advice about <laughs> in certain respects. Um, so I'll start with doctrinally and then I'll just make a few comments about why this goes to show why we should remove commercial from the statute. Those That language should not appear. I think that to the extent there's some consideration about what commercial and non-commercial means, I think it's focused on the act and the direct consequences of that act, um, um, meaning that you might be a for-profit um, entity, but that you, sorry, yes, a for-profit entity, but you might do some acts which are non-commercial. Similarly, you might be a not-for-profit who does commercial activities, for instance, by selling merchandise or books or what have you. So I think it's not judged by reference to the, the profit-making status of the entity 
making the use, but it's, I think it's meant to be tied more to the direct consequences of the use. But as you've mentioned, there's an issue, which is, okay, so let's say you're doing some preparatory work for a film. Well, eventually you want to make money, right? And is that a problem? And I think that the, the, this is why I think the Canadian approach in CCH has a lot to recommend it because the Canadian statute doesn't refer to research for a non-commercial purpose. And so the, the, the Canadian court was able to say that, that fair dealing can apply to lawyers doing law for profit. Um, and so you could then inbuild it as just part of the fairness factors, for instance, the purpose of the use. Were you immediately trying to make a whole load of money or what about other purposes that you might have, for instance, transformativeness or artistic expression? Um, and indeed, when you look at some of the US cases, like I'm just thinking about all those cases that Jeff Koons has generated over the years, which he has defended successfully under fair use, he makes a load of money from selling artwork. And that's never been a, a problem for him winning fair use cases where his use is transformative. So I think it goes to show like there's a real argument in favor of get non-commercial out of the text of the fair dealing exceptions. And it can be something that might be relevant to fairness bearing in mind that commerciality, and I think the US Supreme Court has it right, should not govern in instances where you've, you know, where you've got an other important purpose or imperative. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. Thanks so much for that. That's yeah, okay. I hope, yeah, let's continue the conversation now. Maybe let's leave the floor for other questions. But yes, again. Marta, it looks okay. like there's some questions arriving. Yeah. Hope they're good ones. Yes, thank you both so much. I mean, I think I really like this idea of keeping the conversation going. I mean, I think this is, um, I think this is very much a theme. And yes, um, there are quite a few questions coming in. So I'm just going to apologize to anyone whose question I don't read out. Um, just looking at them, what I might do is combine some of them. Okay. Because there are particular themes that are coming up. And I haven't even been looking at them. This is going to be a complete ambush, right? Here we yes. go. Yeah, yeah, because I think I can see them, but no one else can. So yes, well, I haven't um, opened it up because I didn't want to be distracted. So so throw them at me. Let's let's see how I do. Excellent. So um, so there are well, at least one of them. I'll come to that one in a moment. You won't be surprised given your provocation around the Orphan Works Directive. There was some about. Oh, there's some Orphan. I'm really I'm in. I really want to hear what people have to say about this because I might be wrong. Right, my intuitions may be wrong. Anyway, keep on going. So, um, and so, but just before that, I thought actually, um, before going to that question, I wanted to um, raise a question from uh, Chris Morrison about socio-legal work. And the question is, to what extent does or should socio-legal research influence the doctrinal analysis of copyright law? Well, I mean, I think that in certain respects, I think what we've got to understand is that the audience of legal commands is not just legal experts. That's part of the audience. So part of the audience of legal commands are judges and those who enforce the law and those who advise in a professional capacity on it. But another set of people in the audience for legal commands are the people whose behaviour is regulated. Now, there's a question of how much that means that the ordinary, I'm not suggesting that we therefore say that statutory interpretation is about what the ordinary person on the street thinks it means, right? That that is, that is not at this stage an accepted part of statutory interpretation. So it's not a matter of throwing the rule book out the window in relation to how we read statutes and how we read cases and so forth. But it's thinking about the question of how does this whole other audience understand the law and they've been left out for many years. And I think one of the things which is really exciting about the sort of empirical turn in IP scholarship, which Marta, you're a part of, and I'm a part of, and I think Create has a lot of support and, and your database on empirical projects and so forth, if, I, if I've got that, got that right, is in actual fact looking at this whole other group of people who have to interpret the law. So it's not a matter, as I said, of changing the doctrinal rules. It's a matter of saying, well, if we're going to think about how do we reform law, how do we fix it, what's wrong with it, and so forth, we don't answer that question from cracking, cracking over, open the statute, reading some cases, and coming to a conclusion. And I think in copyright exceptions for many years, that was the approach that was taken. So you can read entire law reform reports where I don't think a single piece of empirical 
research was undertaken. It was all basically done. And we read loads of cases. We've read the statutes. This is what the words mean. So it's it's done by lawyers for lawyers. So so that's I, so I think it's really it's adding a new dimension. It's not necessarily replacing lots of stuff, but it's adding a missing dimension to that sort of analysis. Um, thank you very much. And I think that this will be uh, certainly of interest uh, to a lot of people listening. And, and I agree, I mean, this empirical turn is really something that's quite fascinating um, that's happened in intellectual property generally. Um, and so moving, I suppose, from that question about um, the socio-legal research to now, as I sort of uh, previewed is this question around the Orphan Works Directive. Yep. So this was sort of kicked off um, by a particular question from Naomi Korn, uh, Korn Associates here. And in short, it's would you be able to expand on why you think the loss of the EU Orphan Works um, exception was not a bad thing? And there were sort of subsequent questions around whether um, it isn't necessary, in fact, for cultural heritage institutions um, and the like to have access to this. So I think perhaps the question underneath that is, well, what do you do in the absence of it? You do it anyway. That's the answer. Okay, so I'm, hap I'm happy to talk, to talk to this in a bit more detail. Um, okay, it's thinking about, so, so my position is not that we don't use orphan works, it's that it's kind of, you proceed using risk management, and whatever exceptions are available, including our really great fair dealing exceptions, including for quotation, which um, I think there are good arguments that it covers entire works and um, images and, and, and so forth. Now, and in saying this, my answer is partly philosophical and partly pragmatic. But I think we need to think about we have an exception which is tied to the registration of works on a register. And we need to ask ourselves, why do we have a bureaucratic process for dealing with orphaned works and what does it achieve? So let's think about the things it could conceivably achieve. So one thing having a register could achieve is to make sure that cultural institutions and other, and other heritage organisations have some oxygen of publicity, um, some spotlight on them to make sure they're not abusing any statutory interventions to permit them to use orphaned works, right? So if they register, we can see what they're doing. And in fact, it may well be that with various guidance given in relation to how to conduct reasonable searches and so forth, that that is useful in the process of knowing what to do to, to search. My sense is that the best people who know how to find orphaned works are not legislative drafters. They are people in cultural institutions. They know how to do it. Rights officers do this every day for a job. They, they know, they have networks where they talk with one another. So the, the repeated reports I heard and saw in the field work with, with, with rights officers know what they're doing. And I don't see evidence that institutions are playing fast and loose and would go on a digitization spree in a world where they rely on risk management. It's not happening in Australia where that's their approach, right? It is very thoughtful um, and done with a, a great degree of care by people who think very carefully. So it's not a free for all. So that's one issue is you might say, we want, to, we want to watch what institutions are doing and we want to give them some guidance about how to do it. And I'm not too sure that argument stacks up. Another argument in favor of the database is it helps connect copyright owners with their works. So our actual goal is to make sure that all these parents out there with all these orphaned works are reunited with their with their their copyright works. Now, I don't know about you, but I have not thought to myself, hmm, might look up the EU IPO orphaned works database over the weekend, see if there's anything that might be sort of connected to me. Right? In actual fact, 
and I'd be interested to know whether or not these databases have worked to actually reunite any owners with their works in an environment where the database would do that, but not people actually going on the website of the institution. So to the extent I've heard people from institutions talk about resurfacing owners, it's often been in the context of things like war memorials, um, where um, people go online and they look at, you know, the, some records or diaries or whatever they've been digitized. They're like, oh my God, that's actually my grandfather. And then oftentimes it's very positive engagement that happens at that point where all manner of contextual information is, is um, um, uh, provided and people are very happy. So in actual fact though, the, the point is not whether people are happy, they might not be happy. The point is they find it through looking at the institution's website. And in actual fact, that's the point with orphaned works, right? This is all gonna take place online, right? We are going to see it because we just have to click on their websites and we see what uses are being made of works. And I think if you want to reunite copyright owners with their works, having people look at, at the website of the cultural institution itself is gonna be a far more efficient process. Um, there could be an argument then about um, payment to the extent that the EU orphaned work scheme that reliance on the exception there is a requirement then if somebody does resurface that you have a negotiation and the copyright tribunal can then participate in that well that's remedies limitation right you can actually get this if your concern then is paying for it if an appropriate person comes forward you can through how you decide to remedies limitations to work, you can figure out at that point what sort of, if any compensation should be payable or what sort of negotiations can take place. So I see remedies limitation as achieving the same thing in essence as the orphaned works exception, but without the bureaucracy. And I just think like, how much time are we spending with people submitting applications to be on a database? Is that really a good use of time, right? And that's what I'm concerned about. It's actually the bureau bureaucratic overlay on what is in essence a remedies limitation. So I just say let's have a remedies limitation. Um, that would be that would be the that would be the reform I'd recommend. And in the meantime, in the absence of a remedies limitation, risk management and the existing exceptions, which I think particularly when once you have quotation and so forth, do quite a lot. Have we had a rejoinder, Marta? Has it, have any questions to come back on that? Yeah. So interestingly, there was. Um... Uh, from what I've been able to pick up in the comments that someone is pointing out actually that they really like the answer that you do it anyway. That there might be sort of flaws, um, but that you might actually end up with the same result. It's the Australian approach. It's the Australian approach. They're doing it anyway. Um, as I said, under risk management, they were like section 200 AB. We don't understand it. It's, it's, it's too difficult. Oh, but we've risk managed this entire collection. <laughs> Don't want to make that sound like that they weren't thinking like you know very thoughtful in a thoughtful way no um oh that's wonderful so i can see how this might sort of spin off um into lots more questions about this um i just want to give a chance to um another uh few questions um because this i should just add that the questions seem to go from the super specific um to you know can you tell us more about you know how you did all of this and over the period of time so um what i'd like to move to is actually to give a chance to um those who have been asking about how you did this work um sort of why you did it um so the sort of the how and why um of the method including okay. sort of what's happened with the data um Oh, by the way, someone is saying that you're making a lot of sense. I agree. Um, That's good I to just hear. wanted that. And what the question in particular was around not just sort of how you did it and why and how you found it, but there's also a specific question here from Jane Secker that ties some of these questions mm -hmm. together around the fact that given that you collected your data over um, a, a pretty long period of time, um, did you see a change uh, in the sort of themes that arose earlier to more recently? Yes. Were people becoming more comfortable with using copyright yes. exceptions, for example? Yes, okay, so um, the why, okay, it starts really prosaic. Many years ago, I had a job in a law firm, which I wasn't really enjoying, and Melbourne Law School was hiring for a project with professors um, Andrew Kenyon and Andrew Christie, a, a, um, they needed a research fellow to come onto a project copyright and cultural institutions. And I threw my hat in the ring and got this job. So it was my escape 
from the world of corporate law. Um, and it was just something which I really, it was a project I really enjoyed and it made me, fortified my view that the academy was the right place for me. And I ended up then doing my doctorate um, on the same sort of project, but going to the United States and Canada. So what some people might call a jolly. <laughs> because I got to travel around North America for a number of months going to museums and libraries and galleries and asking them about their copyright issues. And I think, as I, as I mentioned at that stage, like that's where what became really interesting was the exceptions part. It was just kind of one of those projects where with empirical work at times, you just don't know what, what you're going to get. You have to just get in there and do it and see what emerges. And sometimes projects go in different directions. Um, <clears throat> then in terms of the <clears throat> in terms of the actual mechanics, I am more than happy if people want detail um, to explain that. And actually in the book, um, there is a detailed explanation of the um, methodology. But to give you the, the summary, um, I did um, 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 semi-structured interviews because I thought that, because I wanted to understand decision-making processes and how people think about law, that that was a sort of methodology, that was a sort of um, um, methodology that, that required, or the sort of goal, I should say, the sort of goal that required um, an interview-based methodology because people writing surveys just wouldn't include enough detail. Um, I obviously had to choose which countries to go to, and you'll notice that they're all common law countries where English is spoken, right? So this is a really clear, like I've got to make it really clear. That's why this is not quantitative survey and it's not intended to reflect other jurisdictions. Um, it, I sort of chose the jurisdictions for reasons of, of, of language and the, the sort of fair dealing, fair use system, common law backdrop, sort of history in the sort of, um, um, sort of British legal system as well. So there were some decisions there, but there could be some very interesting comparison work done with whether it's European countries or um, um, sort of countries in whether it's developing countries or, or what have you. So there's all manner of, of analysis you could do. Um, and I, to be honest, was focused mainly on leading institutions. In the initial batch of field work back in 2003 and four, we, we, I did some field work with um, um, smaller and regional institutions. So this was in Australia. So this was like <laughs> literally going to like the Bendigo Art Gallery and the Upper Whoop Whoop Historical Society, right? And what does the Upper Whoop Whoop, Whoop Historical Society know about copyright? Nothing. So they are risk unaware. And I just thought that this isn't the smaller sort of institutions who are risk unaware. They're not what I'm looking. I want to go to the larger institutions who are thinking about copyright at the forefront of trends. Um, and yeah, so that was, uh, and the, the questions actually, I, I, I kept remarkably similar over the years, despite perhaps more of a focus on exceptions as time went on. To Jane's question about what did I see, this, this is why I'm really glad that it had such a long gestation period, like being delayed in work, at times you get embarrassed about it, right? It's like the monkey on your back, like this project that everyone's like, when's your book coming out? It's just like, stop asking. Um, but I feel like it's the, the upside has been to really see those changes. And Jane, yes, when I think about talking with institutions in Australia back in 2003, 2004, um, there was a degree of copyright knowledge, but there was much more risk aversion. Um, there was a real sort of, there was real concerns about using exceptions. There was a real sense that we'll that, that, that the whole sort of idea of will be the test case, will be on the front page of the newspapers was prominent. I don't think there was as much cross or, or intersector discussion. Um, the Fair Use Review in Australia in 2005, like the cultural institutions could not get together to argue a coherent position. Um, and I've just seen a real change over time in, in, in the knowledge within the sector, the much more commercial approach to risk um, even though people still describe themselves as conservative, they say we're conservative, but what they describe then after that about what they do is so different from the early years. Um, and um, yeah, so there has been um, some real changes. That said, it can go in both directions, right? So in Canada, the big question at the moment is if 
there's a if the Supreme Court says that York University's fair dealing guidelines were not actually within fair dealing, and I don't know what order they give, but some order that effect, there is a question about what will happen in Canada. And I'm not too sure can they, other Canadian institutions, museums and, and, and galleries and such have really sort of taken on fair dealing in any meaningful way. So it's really dynamic is I guess, guess the point. And, but there are things you can do to be more savvy copyright operators, not just in relation to exceptions though, but everything. Like one of the things I observed in Canada, I can recall is, I mean, is going in and reading licenses and assignments that just clearly hadn't gone through enough legal scrutiny. So in, in, in suggesting that, cop, that copyright needs to be resourced correctly, it's not just so that we can all make use of exceptions, it's so we can get licensing right and make sure the right people get paid, right? That you get licenses from the right people, that the terms are fair and so forth. So it's not just an exceptions argument, it's a copyright management across the board argument. Um, thank you for that. And at the risk of, um, I'm sorry, not name checking everyone who's put in um, the questions, um, I wanted to follow up um, with just a, with a very quick follow up based on a question that I saw um, much earlier and have now lost track of, which is, do you think that your method is adaptable to other countries? So I think presumably not yeah. common law countries. Well, I think that the, the overarching method definitely um, uh, in terms of semi-structured interviews. So that methodology is, and I think also this idea too about legal commands having different audiences, that's, that's also transferable. Um, and if you look at the book, I do list the questions I ask. I don't know whether I put them in verbatim, but I do have a very comprehensive um, description of what was done for this very idea that it may, I mean, I could only do certain, um, I could only, could only go to so many countries, there's only so much work you can do. But if we all do use a sort of similar methodology, it just makes the data really comparable. So the, the, the book does contain a detailed analysis of the methodology for that reason. So that I'm transparent and that others can potentially then do similar work or we can compare more readily. Thank you for that. I expect that that's going to be um, very useful. And then potentially, you know, we see studies in the future where there's sort of building um, on this, yeah. which would obviously be amazing. Yes. Um, sort of still slightly on that point, but perhaps more about the results. Um, there are a couple of questions around um, the management of risk. So uh, the fact that even with the quotation exception, the experience of publishers being sort of hesitant to rely on it, mm. but also um, someone asking uh, what you mean by this. Is that a fear of cost of litigation, um, a fear of infringing on a commercial work? And if I can just squeeze in a completely different question mm -hmm. um, about insurance, about whether this is something to do with insurance costs as well. Okay, so um, just an aside on quotation and publishers, I'm just going to um, publicize a project that I'm doing with Professor T Tanya Applin. We're actually going to do an empirical project in relation to quotation and the publishing industry. So um, we will be reaching out to people in to, to help with that. It's going to be an empirical project. So um, just a little aside, and I think Tanya might even be on the line. Um, okay, but in terms of in terms of, of risk, um, I think that I wonder whether the big fear is the unknown. So one of the things that I've sort of suggested in how do you deal with risk is, is actually figuring out, having a greater sense of what are the risks you face. Um, and I guess what I'm, I mean, years ago, as I said, I was in uh, practicing as a lawyer. I was a junkyard dog litigator. I understand how litigation works. I understand what happens. I understand procedure, evidence, the sort of remedies, the opportunities to to deal to, to to settle disputes and all that sort of stuff. So one thing I wonder is whether people just have this vision that, as I mentioned earlier, one day complaint, next day, horrible judgment against you. So I guess one thing is it is just a question about whether some of it's this fear of what the litigation process is going to look like and just sort of imagining the worst. But I suspect there's other things as well. So I suspect that the sorts of things people are concerned about are often, uh, often to other things like relationship management, 
right? Not a good look for major collecting institution to be seen to be infringing copyright. So even if you've got all the best arguments in the world, the concern about the reputational damage. And this kind of then connects into sort of, to put it in then like more academic terms, sort of social norms discussions, right? So in terms of what do good institutions do? And you might say, well, good institutions don't infringe copyright. So the concern might be, even if you've got the best arguments ever that your junkyard dog litigator um, lawyer can win for you, that in actual fact that the harms are not just in that context of the cost of litigation and the potential exposure to remedies, but in the meantime, relationship management concerns and reputational concerns. And I think one thing to think about though is on the one hand, you might say, look, it's not desirable for the major collecting institution to, to, to be seen to be infringing copyright. But another thing to think about is it actually works the other way, which is I think there is a real imperative on institutions to make their collections publicly accessible. So if, and one of the things too, and this goes back to Jane's question about changes over the years. When I started doing this research, people's reports were that that artists and such would get on the phone and they'd complain that I saw an image of my painting on your website and you didn't ask for, for permission. Fast forward 10 years, artists get on the phone and they say, I was just on your website. I see all these images of everybody else's paintings. Where's the image of mine, right? And whether or not it's also understanding that just as there might be a concern about reputational hit in relation to infringement, there's also a reputational concern in relation to not doing stuff in the online space and not making your um, collections accessible. So I suppose in terms of, of risk management, it's sort of thinking about, okay, um, like really kind of perhaps even going up to intuitions about what are the imperatives on us? What are the expectations on us? How do we manage our relationship with artists or publishers or whoever it is, right? So is there a way that we can, how do we work in vagueness and copyright law and vagueness and exceptions into an environment where we have a pub, the public who wants access to works, the government or whoever's giving us money but may say we don't want you to infringe copyright, artists and publishers and content distributors and other people who might be a, a crucial source of content, educators, researchers, et cetera. So one thing that came through in the US interviews, for instance, was rely on fair use, but tell people you're doing it, right? So they would say, dear artists, this is what we're doing with your work. We're relying on fair use for the following activities. Can you please confirm the, the attribution? Here's a sample, you can get a free book and what have you. And actually being, so, so relying on exception, not necessarily being antithetical to relation management concerns. Um, so, Sorry, that's a bit of a free-ranging answer. Do you think I've covered it okay, Marta? Oh, insurance. That's a good question. I mean, one of the I think one of the things too where, where exceptions analysis can really sort of go down the drain is when you have a funder or a distributor who says you have to have cleared all the rights. So I think there is actually a question about sort of the joined up thinking about whether or not we also need to encourage funders, distributors, and so forth to say that exceptions are good enough. Um, because that that can certainly be a problem. I don't know about insurance insurers, um, but I do think that in terms of risk management, one thing that I have heard suggested quite on quite a number of occasions is don't buy insurance, self-insure by just saving money. Um, and that in actual fact, like um, so, this sort of all these ideas of schemes that that people could sort of the institutions could set up that they all pay in a bit of money in case somebody gets sued. So I have heard about some. Um, sort of out there ideas for how to deal with this insurance question. But I don't know as such about the specifics of whether insurers also say you need to have cleared all rights, but I definitely know of funders and distributors who say that. Thank you for that. Um, I think probably we have time for two more questions where I'll squeeze in actually one of my own questions by abusing my position as chair um, on the back of sort of some of the questions that have come in and sort of uh, looking back at Bart's comments as well. And so there was a question um, broadly along the lines of, is it possible to find consensus? So Bart spoke about best practice codes and creating sector specific best practice codes. Do you think it would be possible to find consensus amongst 
all parties or somehow to broaden this out, which I suppose leads to my specific question, mm. because I was really struck where you mentioned, I think one of your interviewees talking about quotation being nicely nondescript, yep. which I love. And I wondered also to what extent there's a language issue here that makes a difference um, to perhaps the feasibility of finding consensus or not. Okay, so with consensus, I think, I don't know whether it's a desirable aim, and I'll tell you why. Because you need people at the forefront, and the people at the forefront don't don't leverage off, don't, don't have consensus, they have being at the forefront. So I think that just bear in mind that um, um, consensus might be the kind of the second wave behind the like, so the first wave is the people at the forefront who are trying new things and pushing the envelope and then everybody and then people sort of flood in behind them and whether that's where the consensus is but you need the people constantly pushing the boundaries and thinking and being the leaders in the field so I think that in terms of consensus what you can probably get consensus of is a slightly more conservative position or uh, than what the, the leaders of the field do. But we need leaders of the field. We need people who say that when it comes to fair dealing, like it's, it's intended to go to court and have judges decide things. So sometimes you're going to have to make case law. You're going to have to make new law by every so often somebody's going to be the defendant. And, and um, um, so I think that that's, that's just something to bear in mind. And actually, it probably won't be cultural institutions a lot. In the US, you look at who's the defendants and it's like Google, right? <laughs> they're sort of, you know, it's often other entities that, that are producing the case law, not just cultural institutions, but, but there'll be some cultural institution defendants. In terms of, of, of language, just to clarify your question, is this in relation to like the wiggle room within the language of the exception? And is that what you mean that in actual fact, we could have, for instance, different understandings of what quotation is and what that means for consensus? Is that? Um, so both. So certainly in the UK where we have it, but for other countries that might be thinking about it, would it be worth using the language of quotation compared to um, something I, else? Okay, so this is what I think professors Applin and Bentley would say, quotations in Bern, please follow the language of Bern for quotation. Um, because I think what they say is that there are these kind of narrowed down versions of quotation and that people and that countries include unnecessary limitations. So follow the language. I think that I, I, I hope I'm representing them correctly in, in what I've just said. Um, that they that, to not sort of introduce loads of limitations and quotation is the language in that or at least the, the English term that is used. Um, and so they might well say follow follow burn. I mean, I think that I think that then you might think about other exceptions, right? So so if we were sitting here with a blank page, would we go pastiche? That's the word we want. Well, we may not, but it's in the act. And so I really like law reform where it's already done. Right. And I actually think there's arguments that pastiche is superior to transformative use, for instance, in the US. So I guess I guess the key thing I would say is strip out unnecessary limiting clauses. That was one of the key ideas when I went through all the things I do to fix like the UK Act. Strip out unnecessary limitations um, and then include language which has some capacity to, to sort of, you know, quotation can have some breadth. So can education. So can parody. So to use to, to not try to define language within an inch of its life, because that's not how a standard should work. And we need standards, I think, alongside some well-drafted rules. No, thank you for that. And um, I see that we have a couple of minutes, which allows me to squeeze in a question um, I noted at the very start, which is why I noted it from uh, Adwoa and Koma, which is about whether the list of uh, the reform suggestions that you make where, um, whether they're going to be available. And I think this is a question of, are they in your book? Is it in your project? Um, just, I think, as a sort of wrapping it up. No, they're not in the book because they're, I'm kind of like, the, it's a post book thing. Um, but I think we're going to have the slides available and I, I'm continuing to work in this space, but very happy, as I said, to make the slides available. And um, and yes, that, that list was just stuff I, it's just, it was just stuff I came up with of things. And it's actually based on, um, um, 
in, in part on making submissions to the Australian Law Reform Commission a number of years back about supporting fair use in Australia and we and coming up with ideas about what you scrap and how you language things and stuff like that. But I'm more than happy to have the slides um, distributed to, to people if they want, if they're interested in the list. And it's not an exhaustive list. I'm sure there's more we could come up with. It's the principles I hope have, that are clear. No, and that would be wonderful. And I think that answers the question exactly. And I do think that there will be follow up um, by CREATE sort of offering a report. And I think having the slides and uh, would be incredibly helpful in particular yeah. for people who um, perhaps wanted to attend, um, but weren't able to. Um, this has sort of flown by and I sort of feel it like I'd be having this chat um, and sort of keep going and I'm so grateful to you um, for coming to give this public lecture to Bart for the responses to everyone who's participated who's um, made comments and asked questions it's just wonderful. It's been lots of fun I've really enjoyed doing it and um, thank you for the invitation and and I'm really keen if anyone wants to continue the discussion in another fora do let me know. I'm more than happy to, to, to chat. I love this stuff and I'm more than happy to chat more about it. Um, so, yeah. That's perfect. Thank you. And actually, that's exactly what I want to add on to say thank you to Emily and everyone. Yeah, please keep the conversation going um, and keep in touch. Thank you for attending. Thank you very much, everybody.